going to be talking art with Hanali Tata. Um, she's with the pink hair. Hanali, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, why you make art, where you draw your inspiration from. Hi, LaShawn and your pupils. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I am living in the Western Cape in a small town and art is basically my sustenance, my air and that I breathe. Um, I enjoy it. It's escapism of sorts and in a small town especially. So I can be anywhere and I can be anything I want with art. Um, you have created this incredibly unique series of art. You've given us this beautiful example here that's got a lot of sort of fine factors to it, which we'll discuss just now that just elicit so many questions and responses. But essentially, I'd like to first engage with the most prominent um, aspect of your art. You work with rubber and you embroider on it, which is really unusual. It's really unique. It's what's made you um, come to the fore as a South African artist. Can you tell us a little bit how you came to use these needles? It wasn't an instant thing, and it wasn't um, – while I was studying, we played around with a lot of materials, and I really enjoyed that, uh, from plaster of Paris to wax or paper, printmaking, whatever. And then only years after, when, when my children were little, um, I tried to make them toys, and I found these discarded inner tubes, and I thought, well – and there was this rhino that was, um, it was the whole thing in 2011 with that rhino. The rhino uh, thing was very pre predominant. And I wanted to make a difference. So I thought, okay, I'll make rhinos out of inner tubes. And then when I sell something, I will um, give 10% to Kutsi the rhino in Pilansburg. But things didn't, it didn't really, I couldn't, I mean, safe could see with the amount of toys I made. And it was only me, myself, and I that made these toys. And then I thought, well, a friend asked me to put a daughter's name on one of these rhinos. And I thought, how am I going to do this? And then I thought, embroidery. And that sparked the whole thing. And I thought, okay, stuff, um, I'll, I still feel strongly about rhinos, but let's look after my family. So, uh, and I want to get back into, because I was really cross with the art world back then. And um, I thought, okay, I'll get back into the art world with a bang and I'll do my thing. And I had nothing to lose. And I had to show rubber ever after. And I had so much fun. And that's where everything started. What because. I love, <laughs> yeah. What I love about that is you just bringing across again to the kids, how important experimentation and play is. Mm -hmm. How you came across this original way of creating art through that open-minded, playful approach and how we might get stuck into media and ideas. I think that's pretty awesome. Awesome. Absolutely. We're so worried about what will people think, what we make, is it right, is it correct? But if you just enjoy it and it comes from here and you, have, you feel like you just have to get it out, then, then it will have some sort of, I don't know what you will call it, some realness about it, I guess. Do you think the rubber and the embroidery um, read in any way as having any kind of significance or symbolism? Say, for instance, with rubber, um, maybe being a recycled material, embroidery having gender connotations to it in terms of a, a, a media and its association with craft? All of the above. I mean, the embroidery and the fact that it's on a different material, that it's not on cloth. Um, rubber is actually in itself very fetishized, fet a fetish material. Um, so, and it reminds me about skin a little bit. Uh, when you stitch it, it's sort of like a tattoo as well. And as you say, the craft the embroidery, but pushing it, um, taking it out of this comfortable zone and putting it into uncomfortable zone is what makes it exciting for me. And I'm sure working with it is physically difficult because it's thick 
and it's hard and it resists the sewing process. I'm sure like it causes you a bit of like a physical effort to create the embroidery. I get calluses on my hands, I do. But after how many years now, you get kind of used to it. So I cannot, I find it hard to work on normal material. Okay. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's a matter of getting used to it. Used to it. <laughs> And this, series, this image that you've given us here, this It's Contagious, uh, it also speaks into a series of work you've done where you've taken vintage images and you have now, re, you kind of changed them by cutting out aspects and replacing. Talk to us about that. Why? What are you doing here? Why the choice of the vintage images and why the cutting out and embroidering? I have such fond memories of photographs um, hanging in my grandmother's home. All of the, I call them Opa's and Oma's photos because it's all these old, and they also look so serious. And, and I thought, you know, nobody know. well, we don't know who they are. I don't, mostly, most of the times I don't know who they are. And I, they allow me to pretend that I know them or give them a voice or tell a story about it. And so when I find something, I look at them for a long time and then I, it's like a facelift. I cut out their faces and I put in a story that I think that would want to tell the world type of thing, okay, something dramatic. I in this one, it's contagious, tells quite a dramatic story because if we look in the faces, it looks like germs maybe being, invert, and it's contagious. Do you want to speak about that story in this image? Well, the title itself, Contagious, um, that word is fascinating. It can be a positive thing like laughter can be contagious, but especially these days, contagion is a very ominous and a bad word. So, and love can be contagious as well. And so the positive one, the positive version of the word was what, what, what I've gravitated to back then. I didn't know there would be a virus now and that it would have a sinister meaning. So, and you are right, medical books inspire me. So I had a look at example measles when you look under a microscope at bacteria or virus it's actually pretty I, I love the pattern and the colors so I, I wish I wrote down I'm sure I did but I can't find it what which one which sickness or virus or whatever I put in each of them but I think the one was measles and I kind of cannot remember the other one so at that stage I was very fascinated about medical uh, illustrations and words and you know photos. Um, a big mistake that viewers sometimes make when looking at art is to over rationalize over analyze images sometimes and so sometimes we need to kind of maybe get a bit of clarification. Now, if we look at this image, you talked about love being contagious. This is a couple. But if we look at the Petri dishes that are the faces, we see that they are self-contained. So they haven't, they haven't, you know, they haven't infected each other. <laughs> is that you're making or is it just like, like out that way and then in retrospect, we can say that they haven't infected each other. Normally I just do what I feel like doing. And then afterwards, all these meanings appear. And I'm like, hmm, that's a possibility. That's a possibility. It's fascinating. I love it. <laughs> because one could argue that, you know, sort of when we think about old fashioned relationships, there always is this idea passed down to us that, you know, old couples weren't necessary. Like it was very stiff and formal in their relationships. And so one could read maybe that that kind of represents it. But like I say, so it's good to know from the artist that that wasn't intentional. So it's a possible meaning, but definitely. <laughs> <intentional meaning. laughs> but coming back to the stories, you like to refer to stories in your art. Tell us yes. about that in fairy tales and stories. Oh, I don't know, lyrics, music, fairy tales. Um, it's so part of my upbringing that 
it inevitably comes across in my art. And it every time I read a story, I'm getting inspired by it, by Bluebeard, by Sleeping Beauty, by Cinderella. But I like to look at it at a different angle and take things out and maybe combine them and mash it up and it just constantly inspires me, inspires me. So I feed off that, whereas other people would look at what, um, history or yeah, politics. Well, the nice thing about stories is they're quite universal. So then I assume then your art then also becomes universal. So it's not necessarily fixed in South Africa. It has a more broad appeal. Absolutely. And um, one of the books that really um, influenced me was The Uses of Enchantment by Bruno Bettelheim. And they talked about the importance of fairy tales uh, right across the border, um, wherever. So, and that made me realize that, you know, it's not just a local thing. Although in South Africa, we have lovely. Um, fairy tales as well or oh, they don't call it fairy tales here but folk tales or so yeah and um, also just looking at your stories and the whole idea of fairy tales um you know fairy tales are passed down from you know mouth to mouth from the past to now um if i look you using old images with new um you know you read working them by you say giving them a facelift would you say that in some ways and also because you you create this new form of art with the rubber and the embroidery, would you say that in some ways your art is your contemporary self sort of making a link with the past? You put it nicely well put. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, I think we all... Oh, I read such a beautiful quote. I wish, wish I had it now with me that the past is really important in some way to us to find out where we are going. We cannot, but we mustn't get stuck into the past. So that's why I like to twist it around. And I guess if that makes sense. Absolutely, it does. So you, you basically you take the past and you interpret it and you use your bright colors and your new media to kind of look into the future. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> another, thing I'd like to, uh, another thing I'd like to ask you about is, you know, in South Africa, we've got so many different cultures and identities. Um, I'd like to know your Afrikaner identity, your Afrikaan self, like the photograph that you chose. I mean, I'm from an Afrikaans family, so I've got a lot of these sort of types of portraits as well, and they are part of that Afrikaner identity. Do you have um, a sort of a, an idea that you include that in your art, or is that also just a part of who you are as a whole as an artist, and so it's parts of that step into your art? It wasn't consciously about, yeah, I'm an Afrikaner, I have to make Afrikaner art or use it. But I was so cross with our culture sometimes. And that's um, at the Stink Afrikaner show I had that I really want to just say, wake up and don't be so stiff about everything and just relax and have fun. I mean, Afrika we, I was brought up very by a strict father and everything had, in my grandmother's house, everything had to be in place. And, um, <sighs> I just wish sometimes it would relax. So, yeah, uh, maybe it's a rebellion against it, some sort of type of thing, but not consciously, but it comes, it can come across as that, I guess. Well, I suppose, you know, being Afrikaans is politically quite loaded. So it's almost like being a, a contemporary Afrikaans artist, one has an, a sort of an, a, 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 an um, the role or you feel like you redefine Afrikaner identity, you know, sort of not, not necessarily consciously, but like you say, even by the rebelling or by using iconography or so, it's kind of like saying, you know, that being Afrikaans isn't one thing, it's, it's being human and... Human! That's the key word. We're all human. And I, I don't, I try to stay clear from politics as much as I can. But sometimes, without me knowing it, it does seep in, or people interpret it like that. But personally, 
I don't like politics in my work. Okay. Relationship politics, maybe. Maybe politics between uh, a wife and a husband or actually. So maybe just unconsciously it happens in any way. Um, would you say gender roles play um, a part in your expression? So like the feminine or the, the sort of the female roles in fairy tales or like I say, the use of embroidery as a media? Yes, it does. Do yeah. so say feminism is is very part of my my upbringing. I mean, my grandmother wasn't allowed to wear pants and stuff like that. And I, and the Buddha throw that Buddha and Winky by Anton van Vo, She also looks so demure with her sagging shoulders and her head. And I was so like, you know, I thought. My Oma was a tough woman. She was working on a, on a farm and she was she was phys- hard labor, physically uh, doing hard labor. So Afrikaner women sh- isn't, you know, softies. Yeah. And I, I don't like that being portray- portrayed. <laughs> but, yeah, so it does play a role. Yes, you're right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Not that I can think of. I'm just saying thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Well, it's really nice to have art that speaks clearly. And that's one of the things about your art. I think um, it reads well because you speak clearly. And so you obviously have a clear intention in your mind. So it comes across. But it's nice to hear uh, your viewpoint as well and what people, other people take from it. Uh, so it's not just one meaning. It may, might have different ones as well. Well, thank you very <laughs> much. And I'll speak hopefully again in a few years' time with another awesome body of work. Thank you, Lashard.